Hello folks, my name is Graham and I'm standing at a panel saw at Made in Workshop. I'm going to take my mask off obviously because we need, you need to be able to hear me and protocols are observed here but just for this particular video I'm going to drop my mask. I'm standing in front of a panel saw. Uh, many people know these machines as panel saws and a lot of people believe that this is only for cutting melamine and not solid wood. That is not true. This is a very very powerful machine. It's about a seven and a half kilowatt three-phase motor, the main motor, and uh, it can cut any type of wood as long as you use the right blade. I'm gonna step forward here and show you a few blades, uh, types of blades which are very important because a lot of people when they use a saw like this may come up to the saw, especially a commun communal saw like this, and just start cutting wood without checking the blade. I'm not sure whether the camera's gonna pick this up, but you can see hopefully, on this particular blade that we've got teeth that are not terribly close together. This little corner thing here, that little curve there is called a gullet and that removes the chips and sawdust of the wood. And this is what we would call a general purpose or a multi-purpose blade or all-purpose blade. So this can rip wood, which is wood cut along the grain of the wood, which is the hardest part to cut. And it can also cut wood across its length. You get other blades, for example, here's another one which will give you have a smaller blade, but it's still a rip blade, which is brand new. And you can see there that those teeth are fairly widely spaced. This strange little thing here on modern blades is, is helps the chips remove. People ask, what are these little holes here? Sometimes they're holes, sometimes they're little lines. That's to help the blade cool down during the operation. Uh, when you go to uh, composite woods, melamines, etc., we like to use a blade which has many teeth like that because the more teeth it has, the finer the cut. I've got a general purpose blade on the saw at the moment. I'm not going to necessarily change it, although I'm going to cut a piece of veneer. It will chip it very badly on one side, uh, but for the sake of this demonstration, it's an all-purpose blade. It will cut this comfortably. It's not putting strain on the saw or anything, um, but we can change it to this blade if we wanted to, but I'm going to do multiple cuts or cuts with that and a piece of solid wood, so I'm going to keep the general purpose blade on it. Right, some safety features. This is a dangerous machine in the wrong hands. If you want to do silly things with things, you're going to get hurt. One of the biggest problems we have is people wear things around their necks, etc., maybe a scarf or something, or a, a USB a flash drive is hanging on a lanyard around your neck, etc., and this is where if you lean into that saw, you could well, that'll catch you, pull you into the saw, and that can have devastating consequences. The first thing I advise when you do use a machine like this is to find out where the safety off switches are. This machine has two, there's a red button over there on that side, and if we look over here, there's another safety button there. Now, if one of those buttons, either one of them is pushed in, the saw will not operate. There's another safety feature, I'm going back around that way, and that is if this door at the back here, this one, or the little door where the blade is changes open, the saw will not stop. Those are safety features. Over here I have a couple of items that, are, that come with a saw like this. This is a clamp that will fit into one of these slots here, it's called a mitre slot, and you can clamp your piece of work down if you're using it. One of the other things we need to learn about is when you change your blade, again I'm going to walk around, I'm going to move the saw, the sliding panel, the sliding table at the bottom, all the way back, and this is where we change the blade. Now the first thing I'm going to do before I even open that panel, is I'm going to hit one of the safety switches, so no matter what happens, I can't accidentally turn the saw on, and no one else can. They have to physically pull that switch up. There's a in here, and this has got a lot of debris in it. We've had a lot of solid wood here today. As you can see, there's a whole lot of wood there. But we have two items for a panel saw. One is this bar. Some panel saws are different, and this is the main spanner. There's a slot in the back of the saw table here, which I'll put in. And I'm going to turn that blade until this slots in and locks it. Saws of this nature are left hand thread, which means you go, the old adage, lefty, loosey, righty, tighty is opposite to this. So left would tighten it, right would loosen it. The reason being is because the blade itself locks as it's spinning because it's spinning in the opposite direction. So instead of undoing it to my left, I would undo it to my right, which is now undone, and there I can take the blade off. The reason I'm taking that blade off now is twofold. 
not necessary to change it. You need to get some of this debris out, and that's not a good idea to do that when the blade is in there because you will nick your hand. I just want to get this debris out. There's some particles of board, especially solid timber, when you're working with solid timber, where it's very, very difficult to get that to suck up into the dust extraction. For the purpose of the dem few demonstrations we're going to do today, we will probably not run dust extraction because the dust extractor does create some extra noise and the video might not pick it up. So we're going to probably leave some of that out. I think I'll take this opportunity, in fact, to put a bigger, very sharp blade on here. That's a slightly bigger blade. That parts of the blade, by the way, that's the arbor. In this case, 30 millimeters. That tells you how the shaft of the saw, and it has X amount of teeth. Normally you just take two of those little holes there, count the teeth, one, two, three, four, five between them, multiply by one, two, three, four, five, that's a 25 blade to a saw. When you put it on, the blade turns in this direction into the wood, not this way, because it's turning that way, it's not cutting here. I can run my hand here and not get cut. If I turn it down and did that this way, I would cut myself. Put the blade on, make sure it centers on the little arbor there. And in this particular saw, I like to take the nut and the collet, put them together, so that when I put this on, I make sure that I'm not misaligning the collet. Left hand thread, so I'm turning it backwards, left. That pin is still in there, I'm gonna tighten it. Tighten it left. And that's it. Uh, now, first thing, please make sure you remove that pin because otherwise you try and start the saw and it can't run because it's being locked. Then close the door. Whoops, still got some debris in there. The, this saw, by the way, all saws of this nature have a sensor here, a magnetic sensor. You can't really see it there, but if that gets too clogged with debris, the saw will stop and you know you have to you must close the saw, otherwise this will not work. I've done that, I'm going to remove the blades. I'll take the other blades away, get them out of my way. I don't want any unforeseen potential hazards lying on the table while I'm working with this machine. Okay, so we've changed the blade, or we've shown you how to change the blade, we've explained some basic safety features of the saw. I'm going to do more safety demos while we're cutting, etc. This sliding table here, by the way, can be locked into a position like there's locked, so this won't slide now, so there are applications where you might want to do that. It can also lock into different positions all the way down the bed. So you can lock it in certain places. We don't use that terribly often, but there are times you need it. Right, just so we know now, this saw has two fences. This is called a cross-cut fence. This long bar here is a cross cut fence and this one on that side you can see it over there that's a ripping fence again i say ripping is when you take a plank of solid wood and you know the tree grows upright and ripping is when you rip along the length of that tree cross cut is when you cr cut across that long plank of wood so if i was to pick up a plank of wood like this you can see this piece of timber here you can see the grain goes this way the tree grew like that, ripping is through here, cross-cutting is across there. Now on a piece of timber like that, cross-cut is easier, but it does, it, the wrong blade will chip the wood very, very, very badly on the crossbow. When we rip, the fibers of the wood try and close up again as you're cutting that thing, and it can close the blade, lock the blade in, and you can actually just stall the saw, even a powerful one like this. This particular saw, as all saws have, has what's called, if, uh, my cameraman might come in closer. We have what's called here a riving knife or a splitter. This is a piece of steel. This blade is a little bit small for the saw and I can adjust this up and down. That piece of steel there is the same width as the blade itself. So as the wood gets cut and passes through there, it helps keep that wood apart at the back of the blade. Riving knife is very important. There are applications when you might not use it but generally you will. Okay, I have a piece of board on the table here. We've just changed the blade as you saw. I'm going to start the saw and I may have a problem. I'm going to push the button. There you go. Push the button and nothing's happening. 
That's because I switched off the safety switch when I changed the battery. So I'm going to remove it, take the safety off, and start the saw. Now what I'm going to do now is I would like to cut. I would like to cut this board to approximately 400 millimeters across its length, down its length. This is chipboard covered with veneer, so there's no cross cut or rip cut in this. If, by the way, there's, I have done a few cuts earlier. You can see the very jagged edge here and down at the bottom, and that's because I was not using the correct blade for melamine or veneer. I'm not going to change it. This is for something at my workshop, and it's not going to require that that side is ever seen. So it doesn't. I'm not particularly uh, don't particularly care about it. Also, so that you know, a saw blade on a circular saw or a handheld saw or a panel saw or a, a table saw, where the blade enters the wood. It's where the chipping will occur, where it exits the wood, you will have very little chipping. So we'll notice if I cut this here from that side, that blade comes up from underneath. In other words, the saw is underneath the wood, not on top, like a, a, a hand circular saw or skill saw. The blade would be entering from the top to the bottom. This is the other way around. So if I want to clean cut on one side, I make sure that that's the exit side of that blade. So this blade will come through from the bottom, as it were, and up at the top and it'll cut clean. I want to make this 400 millimeters, this particular piece of wood, and I'm going to go to what's called the ripping press, and I'm going to move this, there's a scale on here, down to 400 millimeters, and that's 400 mil. This fence here, the actual fence itself, can move up and down. There's the blade there. I don't want the kind of situation where that's all the way there because my, what can happen is that wood can get trapped between the end of the fence and here. I also don't want to take this all the way down here because as it, as it parts here, it's going to have no place that that wood will be held and the wood will probably go off by me pushing. So I'm going to put this particular fence about the back of the blade for a cut like this. I'm going down and I'm going to switch on the saw. Please bear in mind, folks, we have said for the sake of the video, we're not putting the dust extractor on. I'm going to line this edge, which is a pre cut edge, against that ripping fence because on a board like this, I can cut on a cross cut fence, but if this was a very, very long board, it's very hard for me to control that and I could go off as I or taper as I cut it. So I'm going to take this thing against that blade, making sure I'm uh, making, making sure that level, and I'm about to switch on the saw, making sure that level, everything clear. I've got a tape measure here, that's out of the way. Switch on the saw, and I'm now going to push the board through. I'm going to hold this, this wood to this face, and my hand is going to If I take my tape measure, it's exactly 400 millimeters, 400 there, 400 there, I've cut myself my board at 400 more. I also now want to cross cut that, this length of wood, I want to make this 950 and at the moment it's over a meter. So I can take the same board and put it onto what's called the cross cut fence because now we're going to cut it across the grain as it were. On the saw like this, there is a measuring cage here, you can see there's one there, there's another one down there where you can extend this, uh, this thing right out there and you can go to enormous lengths down there, we're not going to do that now. I have spread the saw earlier, that's for another lesson. I'm now, we have cut that cleanly, so I'm now going to make this 850 mil, uh, 950 mil. Come along here, to the graduation scale, let me just place up that, put it on 950, drop that little fence down, push this board up against there, making sure it's flat against the cross cut fence. And when I cross cut, unless it's a very large board, left hand goes there, right hand goes on the board. With my palm holding that there, I'm pushing that against that fence because otherwise the saw 
blade could make the timber do that. Exactly. Making sure I'm square, switch on the blade. is while the saw is running, they like to reach in there and grab that piece of wood, especially I've seen it, I'm waiting for the saw to stop, from this side. That blade is still spinning, that will cut you. And it's still spinning fast, it will take your finger off. You can, if you had to, you could take, pull the wood away that way. I also prefer that you don't do that at all. Wait for the blade to stop before removing that piece of wood, if possible. I'm now gonna show you something with some danger, dangerous things that we can do with a saw like this. If I take this ball down, pull it down, you'll notice over here I have a piece of solid wood. In this case, this is beech, solid beech. And this piece of wood, relatively short piece of wood, and we're gonna assume that for the sake of argument, I want to cut maybe 20 or 30 small pieces of wood. I'm gonna go that side. Uh, for example, 30, 40 millimeters wide. So I'm gonna, all on, I'm gonna adjust this to 40 millimeters. On the dot, for the more. And notice where I've left the rip, the, the ripping fence. It's at the back of the blade, like we did just now. And what I'm gonna do can be extremely dangerous. So, for the operator and for other people in your workshop. I'm gonna take this piece of wood, so I'm going to feed that piece of wood through there and that will, will cut my little block, right? So this is what's going to happen. When I do that, something's going to happen. So I'm going to start this and I want you to watch what happens. So that wood is trapped between the blade and the ripping fence. Now that particular instance it didn't shoot back, but that blade is spinning at 120 miles an hour, which is about 200 kilometers an hour. That piece of wood could shoot backwards at 200 kilometers an hour. If it's the wrong piece of wood in the wrong shape or something, that can cause a very serious injury. The answer to that is when I'm cutting little blocks like that is to move this fence forward so that as I get to that point where the back of the, the front of the blade is, it's no longer trapped between the two. So if you look at this now, when I cut there and I pass it, by the time I get to the blade, it's moved past that fence and it can no longer shoot back. I'll demonstrate. And you'll see it will not trap the wood. As you can see, it didn't trap any of those pieces of wood, so that's a vital thing to know. Kickback can happen in woodworking machines, and kickback is a very dangerous thing if not if one doesn't understand it, and it can happen with any kind of machine in a woodworking shop. So a thickness of planer, a saw, a table saw, a router, a crosscut saw can all produce kickback when wood is trapped between a spinning blade and another place that you're gripping the wood. As you'll appreciate, when you cut through the wood, the blade might be three millimeters wide or 3.2, which is called the kerf, by the way, that's the thickness of the cut. And if that is trapped slightly or even one millimeter out of line, it will shoot that wood back. So that's a very dangerous thing otherwise. And you'll notice that not one of those got trapped. You heard there was no spinning sound or trapping sound that we heard on the previous video. That can be really dangerous, it didn't kick back as bad as I've seen it happen, but we don't want to even go there. Okay. Another thing you need to do is make sure that your hands are well clear of this machine. What people like to do as well, I'm now going to demonstrate and go on that side of the machine, is they decide they want to cut this small piece of wood. So I'm going to adjust this 
slightly, and they want to, they want to cut it that way, whatever that width might be. So they want to cut that wood there. So if I do the line down there, we want to cut that wood down there. And we adjusted our fence accordingly. And now the guy says, okay, I'll stand maybe on that side. Yeah, let me try that. That's a good idea. You'll come around here. Start to sort of push this through here. And you adjust that fence because we are not, we're not cross-cutting, we're ripping. I'm going to do something here. I'm going to drop the saw blade deliberately to the bottom so I can demonstrate the problem here. So as I'm demonstrating, we're assuming that that saw is spinning. So I come along here, I push down here, and I try and pretend I'm going to keep my hand away from there and carry on through there. My hand is millimeters away from that blade. The other thing is that my hand tends to do that as I'm pushing. You can see the fact of my, the back of my hand is that side of the blade. That is really dangerous. You need a push stick. So we need some, some kind of a device to push that wood through. The other thing is I can't hold this wood with my left hand there because that's millimeters from the blade. So we'll raise that blade again. In terms of raising the blade, there are two schools of thought on this. The old fashioned, many, many years ago, donkeys years ago, they used to say that you must raise the blade as high as possible. Modern thought is to raise the blade as little as you need. In other words, just a few millimeters, five, six, seven millimeters above the timber. Uh, that can cause kickback, but it's unlikely because modern blade technology is very good and they do allow the removal, the successful removal of uh, chips and sawdust, which is what causes kickback in that. So if I want to rip this now, I'm not sure that the cameraman can see. I'm going to feed this through here, but now I have a problem because it's so close to that blade that I don't know if this is not going to pull that wood this way or that way in the end of the cut. Okay, so what I've done is I've got myself a second piece of wood to protect my hands, so I can hold that gently there, or it's my ankle if I prefer. That, when I'm pushing this through, I'm holding that with this wood. One of the things you must not do is try and hold it against the blade, part of the area as the cut goes through, you hold just behind the blade, because otherwise you're forcing that in. Number one, you can force pressure on the blade, which can cause kickback, etc. Number two, this could slip when you've cut a thin piece of wood, you go into the bed and pull your hand and hurt your wrist or something. So we're going to go. I push the wood against the fence, hold it there again, and I can start pushing my feet. You'll notice there that my left hand up to the blade and then never pushed any further. This is the one that pushed through. So it's not, no time with my hand anywhere near that blade. Bits of woodwork, I didn't measure that accurately because I didn't cut on the line, but I managed to cut off that piece of wood. Uh, we could do that again and actually cut closer to that line if we measured it and demonstrate that. So that is uh, 59 millimeters. So if I adjust this to 59, we could do that again and it'll cut on that line. It'll demonstrate again how you can rip a small, narrow piece of wood. See the line's gone. If I take my tape measure, it's exactly 59 millimeters. I broke the piece of wood. My hands were, no, were nowhere near that blade while I was doing that. That can be an extremely dangerous thing to do. You'll notice if you remember now, I did take the ripping fence here and move it forward so that it was still with the blade, not at the back of the blade. Because otherwise, what would have happened? I'll move this back. As I've got to the end of the cut, I hope to be able to see that. This is what could have happened, even though I'm pushing that. Because there's nothing to hold that, that piece of wood. So as I'm going, I do that and I cut it crooked. 
if I move that fence back up to approximately the back of the blade, while I'm cutting that wood, it can't do that. It can only do that once it's past that cut. So that way, it does not affect the cut of the blade. But remember, do not do that when we cross cut. So a piece of wood like that, if we cross cut, we might actually be able to make this kick back again. Go out the way. So I'm going to start that again. It might be able to cause kick back. Okay, folks, one of the other things that uh, I see people doing with the panel saw is that they abuse it in terms of putting large boards on here, smashing them fairly hard into the uh, cross cut fence. Not so much that fence, that fence is exceptionally strong and is locked in position, it won't move left or right. It has a st solid steel bar holding it perpendicular to the work or 90 degrees to uh, the blade or I mean, yeah, 90 degrees to the blade. This back fence here is fully adjustable because I can make the saw go to 45 degrees or anything else. There's a scale on here that will tell you that. So if I loosen, for example, this thing at the bottom, that one there, I can use the blade to wherever I can 